Good evening. Good evening. I'm Harold Pacious. We're on the We're air on the again air with again. another edition, another edition of, of Pacious on the News. News. As you know, we, you know, we try, try uh, to make uh, these, to make as, these topical as topical as possible. And uh, obviously, in the last uh, a week and a half, there's been a lot of discussion about guns, about how to, what we do about the problem. Uh, and you know, there's a great division in our country about this. And it's a very difficult political issue. It's very difficult uh, for many people, including sportsmen, who say, well, why do they want to take my weapon away from me? And uh, one of the issues is, do they really want to do that? Or as the, some of the uh, opponents to gun control say, it's a slippery slope. Once you start, who knows where it will end? We're very fortunate tonight to have as our guest David Tran, who is the executive director of the Maine Sportsman's Alliance. I'm going to let David uh, talk a little bit the beginning and tell you about his organization. Most of you have heard of it, uh, particularly if you're well, a hunter you're and a hunter fisherman. And fisherman uh, uh, you know you about, know about uh, uh, Sam, the Sam, Sportsman's, Sportsman's Alliance, Alliance of Maine. And um, uh, I think that that those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, you know about local rod and gun clubs, uh, you know about fishing clubs and so forth. So sportsmen belong to a lot of organizations. This is one of them. This is the big, uh, I call it umbrella organization for sportsmen in the state of Maine. And uh, we got David here to tell you about it, answer some of my questions. Welcome, David. Happy you're here. Yeah, well, thank I, I you. Wanted to, I ought to say, David, at the beginning, uh, we have a little bit of an unusual arrangement here tonight because uh, David is not with us. He's on Zoom. You know, we had we had these programs on Zoom for about a year and a half, and we're very happy to get back. Well, today, uh, David uh, called and said that he had been exposed uh, to somebody in a car uh, last night whose spouse tested positive this morning. And that person doesn't feel so well today. And David doesn't feel great today. So we told him, stay up where you are. Where are you, in your office? Yeah, I'm actually at home. I have a have an office here. When I was a legislator, I used to do most of my testimony and work here in my office. So I'm down in Waldenboro, Maine, in my office. And and yeah, I appreciate you accommodating the Zoom. Um, I was really just too close to the COVID uh, virus to be comfortable coming down. So thank you for accommodating me. Well, we welcome you on the show, David, and we're we welcome you here. But here I am in the studio, and I'm glad you're not sitting within six feet of me. So, uh, D David, uh, just to put this in context, why don't you uh, describe for our audience uh, what the what the organization is, what SAM is, uh, what its mission is, uh, who its members are, a little bit about it. Sure. So the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine was created in 1976. Um, it was in response to um, growing concerns around hunting and firearm ownership. Originally, our mission was to defend firearm rights and hunting. Since then, though, our organization, because of its reach, its, its membership, its political influence, has broadly expanded its mission to include all sorts of issues, including uh, land conservation. Uh, over the years, we were instrumental in creating the Land for Maine's Future Program, a very uh, popular conservation program. Uh, we also worked to create the Maine Outdoor Heritage Fund that has supplied tens of millions of dollars for conservation. What's unique about our organization, first of all, we have, and we are viewed as a very strong political and influential organization. We have 70 fishing game clubs we partner with. We reach about 30,000 people. So that's a pretty good uh, group of folks that can be influential. We actually have two, really three divisions of SAM. We have a a separate nonprofit C4 that does our political activity. That's our Institute for Legislative Action. I run that organization. I also run the nonprofit C3 side of it, 
We have, in addition to that, we have an education center in Augusta, 112 acres, with an archery, air gun, 22 range, two kids fishing ponds, miles of trails, and we host youth events throughout the summer and fall. So I, I run all three organizations. We have now, I think, seven employees, mostly part-time, two full-time, but um, we're very, very busy. But I think what's unique about our organization is when complicated problems come up, like firearm issues, land conservation, not only are we asked to use our influence, but we also write policy. We can offer up ideas to solve problems. And then having been a legislator for 12 years myself, former state senator and chair of taxation committee, I'm familiar with writing law. And uh, we do that on a regular basis. We work with committees to write law and solve problems. And that's why I'm kind of excited to be on your show. I, I think we've had some successes on the firearms issue side. And I think we, because we don't engage in what I call um, the politics of screaming at each other, that we can be helpful if we listen, offer ideas and try to bring a reasonable approach to issues. And that's, that's our role at SAM and that's the role we want to fill. Okay, so, you, you know, you're familiar with, uh, with, with the debate, obviously, uh, this is your business, and you're very familiar with the debate, and we've now had another incident in a school, uh, and there have been a succession of terrible tragedies uh, where many school children have been killed. Um, any ideas from your point of view of, uh, of what can be done or whether anything can be done? Sure. Well, first of all, I think all of us need to recognize the political atmosphere that exists. Right now, both parties are, are completely divided. Right now, there's 48 Democrats in the U.S. Senate, two independents, and 50 Republicans. The two independents caucus with the Democrats, so it makes it a 50-50 split. So it's incredibly difficult if you lose even one vote as a caucus, then you're not going to achieve the votes that you need to make change. So recognizing that, that current environment, you need to work within it. And you need to find ways to make progress, because I'll explain to folks that are listening, you know, really what it's like in this process. Imagine on these controversial issues, there's an abyss with a narrow bridge that goes across the abyss. The more extreme measures you add to that little narrow bridge, the more unlikely it is to cross it. And that's sort of the place we are right now in our politics. We, we need to find ways to avoid the screaming and work with the people in the middle who can make progress on issues. We've done that since my tenure at SAM started almost 12 years ago. Some of the successes after one of the other tragic school shootings, which we all look at and just are horrified, um, whether you're a gun owner or a Second Amendment supporter or somebody who is, is considers themselves pro-Second Amendment, I mean, uh, pro-gun control, we all are horrified. And I think if we can put that energy to good use, instead of screaming at, at each other, we have options to, to have some successes. Now, after one of the school shootings, Newtown, uh, Parkland, um, I decided and I'm gonna to explain to you why I, I really just decided to um, disregard the politics and the controversy and try to do something. I'll get to those things in a moment. I was in Rockport with my wife at a restaurant. And when I was coming out of the restaurant, a mother with her daughter was waiting for me at the door and said, I belong to the Gun Safety Coalition. And I know who you are and I know you're an influence maker. I want to tell you my story, my tragic loss of a family member who died from a firearm suicide. And I'm hopes that you, when you hear my story, will use your influence for good. And I said, ma'am, I've always tried to use my influence for good, but um, based on your story, I will make, I'll give you my word that I will break from the pack and try to do something, uh, make some progress. So. Uh, this was about four years ago. Um, I Actually, it was quite a while ago. I started it as a state senator. The first thing I did was I wanted to 
work to harden our school's security, not just for shooters, but for all the issues that affect young people, from drug addiction, peer pressures, bullying. Uh, so I introduced legislation to create the Maine School Safety Center. The first year we had difficulties with it. Uh, I retired from the Senate, moved in as Sam director, asked Representative Patrick Corey to work with me to implement that Main School Safety Center, and we accomplished that goal. That school safety center is housed in the Department of Education. It is their job to examine security at all main schools and then make recommendations and connect people to funding to improve the security at their schools. Now, as we've learned uh, most recently with a teacher opening a back door to the school, the best security in the world still depends on humans to implement those security measures. I heard recently that the teacher said that she closed the door, but it didn't lock. Uh, bottom line is she never should have opened the back door to begin with because then it created an opening for the shooter. We must learn from that experience as, as horrifying it is, as it is for that teacher. I can't imagine living with that. But the main school safety center is designed to learn from that experience. Where I learned about this level of accountability and sharing of information, just so you listeners know, when I was a legislator, I spent seven years creating our government oversight agency, OPEGA, that reviews state agencies. In addition, I spearheaded the effort to create Maine's mandatory medical errors reporting system. Both of those systems are designed to learn um, our flaws, learn from them, and, and try to improve. So that Maine School Safety Center is in place. They have a big meeting coming up in a few weeks where they're going to be meeting to share information across the state with our, with our school systems. The second thing what? that happened that I think was very, very important was when red flag legislation was brought to the legislature, the governor called me personally and said, you guys have a chance here to help us. We want to work on something. Well, okay, can you, Patricia, maybe, can, let me just interrupt you. So our folks that are watching know, what was the red flag uh, proposal and who was the governor that called you? It was Governor uh, Janet Mills who called me. I served with her in the Maine legislature. We have a great relationship. And so I, I believe it's a trusted relationship. So the red flag legislation was brought, I believe three years ago by a Falmouth Senator. And um, what it does basically is it allows a family member relative to go to the police and say, I believe this individual is a danger to themselves and others. Ex post facto, which means without that person's knowledge, uh, that individual through a policeman can then go to the court and petition to have their firearms taken away. Well, that's been very controversial because it lacks due process for the individual who's being accused. If you think about it, no crime has been committed. It's just an individual's opinion. So the governor, who is an ex-attorney general, Senator Carpenter, who was an ex-attorney general, Derek Langhauser, one of the best legal minds in the state, we met and said, can we figure out a better process that, that would institute some levels of due process and also connect individuals to services that they need? We met for a month or more, and the best legal minds in the state working with the Judiciary Committee reformed the Maine's, uh, Maine's protective custody statute. It, the, the press called it the yellow flag law. The way that law works is when an individual, somebody calls the police department and says, an individual, John Smith, is acting irrational. We believe they're a threat to themselves or others. The police will come, evaluate the situation. And under law, which has been, it's been in effect for almost 50 years, police have been able, upon, upon probable cause, that a person is a danger to themselves or others and suffering a mental illness, possibly, can put them into protective custody. In the past, what was happening was that person would be held for 18 hours, in a few cases might get access to care, but would then be released. They were still a dangerous danger to themselves and others. When that person now under the yellow flag is in protective custody, 
The law directs the officer to take them to a medical practitioner who has an expertise in mental health services. They evaluate that individual. And then if they concur, then that person, uh, they can go to a judge and that person can have their firearms removed for up to 14 days. At that point, the judge with clear and convincing evidence can put in an order, a longer order to take the firearms away. Um, that process has also a telemedicine component. The, the law called for the development of telemedicine services for that evaluation. That's critical because Bain and other rural states don't have access to the kinds of services that they need to, to treat mental illness and, and the problems that are associated with it. So that was very controversial. It passed with bipartisan support. It is now being discussed at the federal level. I know because I've been having conversations with Senator Collins, uh, Congressman Golden, who are both looking to be players that move legislation forward that can pass the Congress. So there's also one more additional program we created that just passed the legislature. It's, it's called the Safe Homes Program. Uh, under that program, Next year, we're going to have Safe Storage Month, September, in which there's an education program about safely storing firearms and other dangerous weapons, including prescription drugs. In addition to that, there's a second component that when an individual who, in most cases, is in the system or being treated by uh, various nonprofits, at-risk individuals, um, there's a grant program created to assist the families in securing dangerous weapons, firearms, and prescription drugs in the home. That can be in a daycare setting, hospital setting, any setting in which there's a vulnerability, um, the state will work with them to, to better secure their homes. So though, all, all right. three of those programs are being considered right now in Congress. Okay. So those are the, that, that's what you or your group would propose we do to to try to rein in this problem, which is a some people think a national problem. You may not, but the, the people do think it's a national problem. National problem. I, I don't disagree with you. We've got to yeah. do something in this country, and I think we need to look beyond beyond. I know the gun issue is always going to be forefront. It's always going to be controversial. We're always going to talk about it. But we also have to address, I think, as a society, the fundamental issues that we face as a society. I want to say something, and it's going to be a little controversial, but I, I've been thinking a lot about it. Um, as a society, what we view as entertainment is starting to disturb me. Um, I've watched some Hollywood movies recently that are incredibly graphic. It's killing from the beginning to the end. They're using weapons that most people don't even possess now. It, it, it's almost glorifying it. We're yeah. watching things like mixed martial arts. Why do you arts. think, let me interrupt you a little bit, because we'd have to, I'm trying to have a little discussion with you on this, some of, the, some of these things. I appreciate your views and I'm interested in them, but we want to have a little bit of a discussion. So, so w why do you think the movies are like that? Why do you think there's so much violence in movies? Well, what sells is what's on your TV. Okay. So, so they, so they, they like, like it. They like, they like it. It's a, it's it. The market wants it. Correct. People like violence is what you just said. That's very very scary. No, I, I said the market likes it. The people who are that people don't go to a movie with all of these killing and all of this gunfire unless they want it to. They don't have to go. It is appealing to certain people. You would agree with that, that it is, does appeal to certain people. I, I agree that it appeals to certain people, but it, it's not just the, the movies that we're watching. It's the, I mean, the technology has made everything so incredibly graphic and detailed, and it's playing to people's, I don't know, inner depths of, in emotion. You look at the mixed martial arts, for instance, Flipping through the channels, you watch people beat each other to a pulp until somebody's yeah. unconscious. And we call that entertainment. We call that entertainment. 
Yeah, absolutely. They call it entertainment. The world wrestling thing, all of that stuff, people love it. Even the fake stuff, as long as it's bloody or they think somebody's being bloody, even if they're not, they like it. So it's appealing. So it's a, it's a problem in society. It's a problem with human beings. Where, you know, there's certain aspects of human nature that are problematic. It always has been the case. And so I think that's the problem with also, peop, some people think that's the problem with mass killings, that you're always going to have them unless you can somehow reduce them by making it more difficult for people uh, to engage in that. Now, w one of the things I want to talk about is um, gun control. That is, in, for instance, in Australia uh, and or Canada and places where they've had mass killings, not many, they've taken various steps, which steps which I understand that you folks would be opposed to, National Rifle Association would be opposed to, but they've taken these steps and uh, to control guns. And one major step taken in most countries in the Western world is registration. And we have registration in this country, but we have some loopholes. So there's this idea that they want to close up loopholes, like for gun shows and things of that sort. Would you folks listen to that argument if people wanted to propose that kind of a solution? Uh, this is an example of what I started with in the beginning, and that is you need to recognize the atmosphere, the political atmosphere that you're dealing with. There are not enough votes, and I believe you're going to see that coming right up in the House. The Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker, is going to put a bunch of gun control measures um, um, up for a vote in the House. They are admittedly, and even the leadership in the House will say they're symbolic votes. They're going to they're going to be gun control votes, and it's going to be so in the next next election they can be used against those that, that voted. Well, against. you're talking about pol politics. I'm talking. I don't want to talk about politics. What I what I, what I, blah, blah, blah. I, I want to know whether there's anything that can be done, and one of the issues specifically I want to know is closing up the registration loopholes. Okay, so... Okay. so, I'm and, so and, you, and I'm not to, to, to agree with people who want that. You may disagree with it, but I'm just trying to f get answers for people who are watching the program. Sure. Um, my organization actually has a federal firearm license. We attend gun shows. We raffle firearms. Yeah. We run the. I, I'm sure you do, but the question is. But I'm getting to your answer. If you give me patient with me, I'm getting to your answer. Back about seven or eight years ago, when Senator Stan Grosowski was on the Criminal Justice Committee, we did a comprehensive look at gun shows in Maine. All of the people that were conducting gun shows, including my organization, does background checks on all firearms that are either raffled or whatever. Um, gun shows, um, all of them require background checks. What, it, what you're talking about goes on in the parking lot, and it's un, unknown to the people running the gun, the gun, so-called gun show. What will happen is uh, there'll be an advertisement or the, the gun show's going on. People will show up in the parking lot and say, hey, Joe, right. I've got a gun. I'd like to sell it. Oh, That's okay. a private so thing. All right. The bottom line, because we got a lot to cover here, and we've only we've we've used up almost half our time. So what you're saying is it's not workable. Premises, including the parking lots, that a firearm background check be conducted. You can do that. That's a policy decision of the Congress. And given the split that's going on in the Congress, what I'm telling you is. That may not be the best time for that policy. Yes, you can address it. Well, you, no what you, when you say, but I want people to understand, what you're saying is it may not be the best time for that policy because it'll be opposed by enough people that are prohibited from being enacted. And yeah, and, and so, but, 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 but because we got to, we want to inform the people here. So, so, why won't they enact it? I mean, the Republicans seem to be uniformly against any of these proposals to regulate gun ownership because well, they, they say what you say is a slippery slope so that and then, and they may be right they may be right slow the reason that 
I think there's resistance is that it's already against federal law. It's a felony to sell a firearm to a prohibited individual. And that's included in the parking lot. So it's already a federal crime. I know ATF attends those gun shows because I see them and I and I and I know I know they're there, they have a presence and they're policing it. So if you're if you're talking about solutions to this this gun, this event that happened in this school, many people will tell you we don't think that that's going to solve the problem. So that's probably why it's not going to get the focus. Okay. okay, what what will solve the problem? Well, you've talked about the program that you lobbied to get enacted in Maine, to more school safety, more security in the schools, things of the. But there are that, that has nothing to do with the weapons. It has to do with putting more police in the in in, in the schools. And there's some people I know have said, well, we need to arm the teachers. We need teachers in there with weapons. Do you agree with that? No, I do not. Um, yeah. I, teachers, they learn, they go to college to teach children not to handle firearms. They are yeah. not the best individuals to handle firearms. Now, do I think that you can improve security? I suggested on the radio just yesterday that why doesn't why doesn't a school district offer an office to any local county, state police, local police, an office in their school? You can do administrative work. You can do benign things. You can have a low key presence. I know, having been endorsed by the Maine Education Association repeatedly, I've talked with folks over there. They know our stance at Sam. We don't support arming teachers, but once a person, a shooter, is in the building. I don't, I, your only defense is how many bullets that individual has. So you've got to have deterrent. Once they get past the, the gate, once they pass the gate, then it's just a matter of how much damage they do. You can't let them in the door. And if you do, you better be prepared once they're in the building. Oh. You think that, you know, when I was growing up, and I'm fairly old, when I was growing up, uh, my parents weren't afraid that, there were no police in the school, and my parents weren't afraid that if I went to school, I might come home dead, shot. What's caused this? Well, I remember when when all the terrorism activity was happening on our on our jetliners, people were dying in crashes. Yeah. Um, as a nation, we came together and we came up with laws. We created marshals for those aircraft and and great security, and it reduced those terrorism um, incidences to nearly zero. Yeah. We have to get serious about the most vulnerable who are in our schools, not just the children, the teachers, the support staff. Okay. My wife worked so, in a school for many Okay, so school security, security is, what is what you're talking about. Talking no, about. I yeah. think that's the problem once that's yeah. addressed. Um, this individual was known to the police that did the shooting. He had threatened women with violence. Um, he had told people what he was going to do. We need to examine the entire situation, not just of this individual. I'm not afraid of research. Research every one of the individuals who participated in these events and learn from those experiences and then make changes in policy. The firearm, the firearm stuff, to be honest with you, in this environment, the more extreme it is, the less likely it has a chance to pass. But don't ignore wait, wait, wait. I understand. We, I think everybody understands that's watching this show that the Republicans in Congress will pretty much uniformly, all of them, oppose, not all of them, maybe one or two won't oppose it, but oppose most gun control measures. So they understand that. And so I think we're talking about, not about the politics. We understand the politics. But what else can be done? Let me, let me, Throw one thing out, David. In Israel, which is one of the countries that tries its best to control this, because think of it, they're in a part of the world and where there's a lot of violence and where their country is subject to uh, violence from terrorism and so forth. So if you're an Israeli citizen and you want to own a weapon, keep a weapon, you can. They say, yes, you can have a weapon, but to buy a gun in Israel, you need a government license. 
you need to be licensed uh, to have the gun, and the requirements for the licensing include satisfying a minimum age limit, age 27 for anyone who hasn't served in the military or national service, passing a gun safety test, and obtaining a letter from a doctor that you are sound mind and body. What would be wrong with that? It wouldn't affect the people that uh, are your members. They can go target shoot. They'll get a license. They're not going to hurt anybody. Why would they worry about that? Well, there is that darn thing we call the Second Amendment. And people are concerned, and rightly so, that once government has the uh, name and information of everybody that owns firearms, that someday they'll get confiscated. Now, do I agree with that? You have um, well, but what's the Second really Amendment going to have to do, uh, do? I mean, but the sec Second Amendment uh, just says you, you have the right to bear arms. And uh, this is in Israel, you have the right to bear arms, but there are certain requirements uh, that you have to meet. Now, do, Can you look it up? Because I think you're required to have a firearm. I think they're required. No, you can't, you can't have a firearm in Israel. Uh, uh, which really needs a militia. You can't have a firearm in I Israel unless you take the test and unless you get the doctor's certificate. Can't have a firearm. I don't think you you can you can say all you want that makes sense to you, but in this country it doesn't make sense because of um, the concerns that people have around a national registry and what it looks like to confiscate firearms. For instance, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it right back at you. Right now, there's this big push to ban so-called assault weapons. Well, anyone that knows much about firearms knows that um, a so-called assault weapon is a semi-automatic firearm, of which I own some, that we use for hunting. They look like hunting rifles. The mechanism in a well, wait a minute, hold on a second. This is, is this, this is an assault weapon, right? It's an AR-15 is what it is, and that's an assault weapon. A switch on it to make it fully automatic. Well, I don't have the thing here, but I'll look at it. Have you ever seen a Have you ever seen a weapon like that? I, if it's a semi-automatic firearm, that's exactly the same firearm, which is a very provocative photo. But it's the same firearm that that have the same mechanism that a semi-automatic hunting rifle has. It looks just looks different. The mechanism is the same. Well, how much? How much in a magazine? One of these semi-automatics. Well, under the law, you can have a high-capacity magazine. Again, that's the policy of Congress to establish what that number is going to be. I'm not going okay. to All right. I'm not arguing with you, but I want to get information. And so, okay, that's the law. You can have it unlimited or whatever, uh, let's say 90 cartridges, okay, in the magazine. So why not put a limit on it? Why not say you can only have five or six, so that if you had one of those things and you wanted to kill a bunch of children, you couldn't kill 30 of them or 20 of them. Again, that is the policy discussion that Congress is having. What I'm getting at is you try to, to imply that that was a weapon of war. A semi-automatic firearm does nothing on the, on the war field because the weapons they have are fully automatic, semi-automatic. I, 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 I'm not talking. I don't, no, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the war. I'm not talking about war weapons. I'm talking about a semi-automatic where you have to pull the trigger in order to fire a shot, all right? But, but with a semi-automatic, watch my finger. I can move that finger 50 or 60 times in less than a minute. So you can shoot 50 or 60 bullets in less than a minute with a semi-automatic. The question I have, go ahead. The question is, I'm not debating with you. I'm trying to get information. So I'm asking a tough question like, what's wrong with uh, limiting the amount of, uh, of uh, bullets that can be in a cartridge? Whatever you call it. Ask me the question. The, I think the flaw in, in this whole thing is that you're assuming if, that, if we restricted magazines to, say, five rounds, that somehow that was going to change what happened in that school. There are there are me, what, 30 million uh, high capacity magazines in this country. If you do that, you're going to have to confiscate those high capacity magazines. 
that again is Congress's bailiwick. I'm not, I'm not here to argue gun control with you. No. You, you asked me to come on and talk about what kind of progress we can make in Congress in 2022. I told you what that is. I'm not going to come out there and say we're in favor or opposed to these various controversial gun control proposals because that's not the role of the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine. Our role okay. is to make progress. It is to All be right. the, 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 the common sense at the table and work on things we can get done, not keep screaming at each other. All right. Fair enough. I think, you know, I've been doing this for 16 years, so I ask questions. And not every question is a comfortable question. But this is, unfortunately, the way I do it. And I, I, I don't want you to take it personally. I ask questions. That's how I get information. And it's not always the information, you're not talking about you, but I've had people on that the questions I ask, the answers are not the information that people, they want to talk about things that they, they want to talk about. So I'm not trying to be a tough guy here. I'm just asking questions. Now, this is, that's, that answer is important for, for, I think, our audience to understand, is that on these specific uh, proposals that may be made in Congress, for instance, l making it unlawful to be able to have a rifle with a magazine that has more than 10 bullets in it or something, you don't have an opinion one way or the other, you just say it's going to be tough in Congress because there's going to be a lot of people opposed to that. And I think people do understand that there will be a lot of people opposed. That the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess my, my organization has been opposed to limiting magazine capacity um, in the past. I, I don't know what we're going to do this time around, but all I yeah. know is that I'm talking to people at the highest levels of government all the way up um, to the most powerful U.S. senators about proposals that can make progress. We failed in this country to react after these shootings. There's a stalemate. I'm interested in making progress. And if I start making broad statements like the ones you want me to make, then I don't become a, a moderator, a common sense voice in this debate. I become just part of the right or the left. And I don't want to do that. We're going to position ourselves to save lives, and we're going to look at every element of these shootings to do that. Um, we're just not going to get drawn into that broader, more controversial debate. All right. At some point, you know, I mean, I've been in politics now, too. Uh, we have a problem, and people say, well, we'd like to look to the government to so solve some societal problems because, because we are divided. It takes the government sometimes to say, look, this is the way things are going to be. And so uh, you may have to take a stand on some of these specific proposals. We understand that National Rifle Association, do you, do you get, do you get, they, I know they get money from the gun manufacturers. Does Sam get any income or money from gun manufacturers? Well, of course we do. We have an education program in which we have certified instructors that train. The National Rifle Association has one of the finest youth education, firearm education programs called the Eddie Eagle program in the country. They have given us funding for, for our instructors, for our shooting range, safety components. Uh, people want to try to link us because we might have got a grant from the friends of the NRA somehow to gun manufacturers. They can do that all day long. But where the folks that are spending tremendous amounts of money to educate the next generation shooters. You can't do that without money because the gun control community will never give us money for that purpose. So it's, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's an investment really in the future and I'm not gonna be ashamed to say that we take money for that purpose. Well, I would say that I don't wanna ask, ask a question that's unfair. Uh, they, I understand there are going to be proposals, or people want there to be proposals, uh, to ban assault weapons. You have a lot of members that they, they're not, uh, you don't call them assault weapons. The other side does call them assault weapons, uh, but semi automatic weapons, uh, or to strictly regulate them. When they go to, people go to a range or go hunting, do they, 
What is the, and I, I, I'm serious, I don't understand, I think people would like to understand, why, why are these high uh, uh, volume uh, magazines important? I mean, why do they like that? Well, they are, they are simpler to use at a shooting range. But yeah. again, um, a person's choice on a high capacity magazine, I think you could look to the federal courts for that answer. There have been several challenges recently in places like California and others to limiting magazine capacity. And the courts have said, if the bad guy can have it, the good guy should have it too. That's generally well, what they've said. So you, it's a Second Amendment problem, too. You say every one of these, every one of these, um, these laws you're talking about are likely to get challenged in federal court because yeah, we have me, passed hundreds, if not thousands, of gun regulations. And I think we've done pretty much everything we can to bump up against the Second Amendment. And now you're going to start ste stepping on its toes, and that's where you're going to see the challenges. Okay. Well, you know, it's, what's interesting, and I find that interesting, and um, everybody's talking about the most recent gun cases, D.C., uh, Heller versus D.C., which was the, uh, the District of Columbia ordinance which prohibited people from having guns in their homes. And that was struck down by the court. Scalia wrote, wrote the opinion. And that's the law of the land now. And it's the most recent gun case. But what's interesting, and I want to say this not so much for your benefit, but for the people watching the show, because some people do watch the show and this is information. In that decision, and everybody's talking about Heller and they say it says this or it says that, but here's the decision. Very thick. A lot of pages, hundreds of pages. But the court, Scalia writing for the, uh, for the majority, five to four majority. We have to remember, with Supreme Court cases, particularly now, there's usually one or two votes difference uh, and opposite and opposing views. But Scalia wrote for the majority, like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. From Blackstone through the 19th century cases, commentators and courts routinely explain that the right was not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, in any manner whatsoever, for whatever purpose. And they go on and they say, although we do not undertake exhaustive historical analysis today of the full scope of the Second Amendment, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions in the possession of firearms by felons and, men and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings, or, or to prohibit the laws, uh, laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms, like an AR-15. So, I'm not saying what the court will do, who knows, but this is what the court, uh, the majority said. So they've said one other thing. We also recognize another important limitation on the right to keep and carry arms. Miller, which was an original, uh, a, a prior Supreme Court case on guns, Miller said, as we have explained, that the sorts of weapons protected were those in common use at the time the Constitution was written in common use at the time. We think that limitation, says uh, uh, Scalia and the majority, that limitation is fairly supported by the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. So if a weapon, uh, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, so I would argue, others would argue against this. Uh, if if a, a, a weapon can kill in a minute, 25, 30 people, it might be argued, will be argued, that it is a dangerous weapon and as such is not prohibited, uh, is, 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 is not permitted by the Second Amendment. So this is a complicated business. There's no question about it. There's nothing simple about it. But uh, I'm just trying to get information and uh, I understand that People do it. I don't, I'm not passing judgment on. There are people that like to fire these. I have friends who like to fire these weapons. And, um, but hunting, that's the one thing I would tell you. People say to me, 
well, I don't understand the hunting thing, and I don't either, and let me say, I'm not a hunter. So you, you, you got a babe in the woods here who doesn't really understand things. But what, these, these semi-automatic weapons have a, a fire bullets with great velocity. And I watched a 60 Minutes program last Sunday in which they showed that the high-velocity bullets tear apart somebody's insides, that they, that, that much more than a 22 rifle or something like that. What does it do to the animals that they hunt? Do you, I don't know, you may not know the answer to that, but it, it, it pretty much destroys them too, their insides. So I, I'm not sure what you're getting at for, for a question. I mean, a fire- well, the, the, qu the question is, what, what, why do you need a semi-auto rifle to uh, go hunting. That's people ask that question. I'm sure there's a good answer. It's not. I'm not attacking anybody. People look for the answer. Now we've got to the. I guess to the nut. Um, you just said, why does anyone need a semi-automatic firearm? It's an example I, I started with. When people call for an assault weapons ban, they're calling for a ban on semi-automatic firearms. Let's just call it that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, good. Okay. So that's, that's, that's what. That's what. Let's call it that. Okay. So, so first of all, I, I fully support Scalia's decision. I understand what's in it. I read it. Governments can regulate firearms. That policy area always falls back to Congress. And again, if you want to further regulate, that has to go through the through the Congress. Except, you know, there is a push to try to get the ATF to do some of this work with executive orders and other things. But the bottom line is, working through our Congress, through our representative democracy, we make these decisions. And that, that Scalia decision reinforced that. You take it to the Congress, you have the debate. Right now, you're not going to get those kinds of, of bans on semi-automatic firearms through Congress. It's, you know, it's an emotional debate. It's going to drum up a lot of money and voters in the next election, from one side or the other. But ultimately, do we make progress on this issue? I am, I am dedicated as I was. My wife is sitting with me now. She was there when this lady and her daughter pleaded with me to use my influence. And I promised her I would. And I'm going to do that. I'm not going to become part of the screamers. I want to be part of the solution. So with that, getting back to your semi-automatic firearms, you know, your description of how a bullet works, that's what they're designed to do. In a hunting setting, the most important thing as a hunter for me is ethics. When I pull the trigger to harvest a deer, I want it to be a humane kill. You shoot it with a 22 or a small caliber firearm, you wound it. The likelihood of killing it in a short, quick kill is very slim. That animal is going to suffer uh, maybe for days. Those firearms for hunting purposes, including semi-automatics, are designed for a quick, humane kill. It's up to every hunter to use ethical shot placement to do that cleanly. What you're doing is you're, you're talking about um, how that um, works with humans and the graphic nature of what that looks like. That yeah. is horrific for all of us. None of us want that to happen. And, okay. and so yeah, I was asking about the answer. And, and, and the answer is a good answer. You know, one that I can understand that it's a humane way to shoot uh, an animal. And uh, also in hunting, again, back to my other question, because it just seems logical to me, but it could be illogical. I admit that. Uh, the magazine capacity, high capacity magazine, uh, is that useful in hunting? In a hunting setting, I know because I served on the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee for 12 years. I've lobbied in front of it for another 11, and two years prior to that, I served on the advisory council. Um, rounds are, um, are limited for several reasons. First being, uh, for humane and ethical reasons, meaning it's a fair chase issue. You don't get to shoot 30 times at a deer running through the woods. It's just in society, the legislature wouldn't accept that. So you've got, you're limited on the rounds that you can use. 
Uh, for safety purposes, you can't be spraying the woods with 20 or 30 rounds. So the legislature has said, no, we're going to limit it. So um, there is a limit on it, but it's not because of, of what you're getting to, alluding to, that um, it's in a, a person to person confrontation. In hunting, it's different. It's for yeah. the safety of those that don't hunt, it's for you know, the ethical hunt um, and all of those, those types of things. Sure. State law that the, the state law that regulates the, uh, whether hunt, how many shots the hunter can take or something like that? Yes. What yeah. is it? You can have so many in your fire. For instance, um, when you're duck hunting, the federal law is that you have three rounds in your, in your shotgun. Um, you also have to use um, non-lead ammo when you're hunting waterfowl. So there are regulations on, but yeah. I have a semi-automatic firearm for duck hunting. Yeah, good duck hunter. I'm kind of terrible. My wife will tell you that, <laughs> but but yeah, it is limited for that purpose. Oh, I, I never knew that. So so in other words, if I was a hunter and I had an AR-15, there is a state law that regulates how I use that AR-15 when I'm in the woods hunting. Use an AR-15 duck hunting. You can only. Uh, you can not duck, duck hunting. I'm talking about yeah. non-duck hunting, not ducks. Sure. Uh, deer. How about how deer, deer how? or moose? Yeah. Um, you, I believe the rounds are five, and um, you're limited. Uh, an AR-15, in my opinion, you know, and it's up to the up to the hunter to make those choices based on their skill set. Is not my caliber of choice. Wait, 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 wait. I'm just, yeah, but, yeah, I understand it's not your. But, but, yeah, uh, the, my question is. Is there, I asked why you need, uh, you know, so, so many bullets if you're out hunting, and then you said, well, you can't, you gotta be careful, you're gonna spray the woods, you're gonna, it's a safety issue, and so forth, and I, I may have misunderstood, there are no state regulations as to how many bullets you can have in your magazine when you're out hunting, is that correct? State law, okay. you can only have so many in your gun. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, I wasn't, I wasn't clear, I wasn't clear on that. So look, uh, I sensed that you thought I was on the attack here, and all I'm doing is trying to ask questions that I know these people want to ask, and you're trying, and I understand this. I, so I say I've been doing this a long time. You're trying to. You, you, you have a job to do, and you're trying to tell us how you want to do your job, and I, I think that's excellent. I have no problem with that. I'm just trying to, because I don't understand hunting. That's why I asked you about what the, what the hunters do. I don't, I'm not a gun guy. I don't have a gun, so I'm at a real disadvantage, because I know people, I have good friends, who love guns. I have guys that have go, I know, I know a guy, I went traveling with him, he bought two pistols for thousands of dollars because he loves guns. I think he's a good guy. Okay, so I'm not passing judgment on that. I'm just trying to get answers because there is a debate, as you say, in this country. We're all aware of the debate. There are unreasonable people on both sides of the debate. There are people who say things that are inaccurate on both sides of the debate, and our job here is just to get information to people. So I'm, I, I always want to explain to you, I'm not after you. That I, I do want to bring up something that I think it's, imp it's an important discussion topic. Um, in this country, because of the violence levels that occur um, in inner city, it gets a lot of attention in the media, there's a lot of violence. Uh, the, the rates of crime are going up significantly in heavily populated urban areas. We see that in Maine because people are moving here because we are the safest state in the nation to live as it relates to violent crime. But there is a stark divide between urban and rural um, U.S. citizens. And in the rural setting, like in, you know, I live, I grew up in a rural area. I view guns much differently than, say, somebody who grew up in the urban areas where, where hunting is and recreational shooting 
just don't exist. Guns are seen more as a tool of crime, I think, in some of the more heavily populated urban areas. In the rural areas, um, guns are passed on, they're family, family heirlooms, they're passed on from generation to generation. They're not seen as you know, a scary tool that's gonna be used in a crime. And so there's two different cultures that have evolved, two different views of firearms. And I think that, that a lot of times you're seeing that clash going on where the people in the inner cities are saying more gun control because they want to reduce crime and, and unnecessary death in their, in their cities. The people in the rural areas are saying, well, God, crime and violence is very seldom and it's a big part of our culture in rural areas. We don't understand what they're, what they're driving at. So that's the clash that's going on, I think, is this stark divide between rural and urban areas. No, 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 you're absolutely right. I don't. I think there's no, no, no question about it. And um, somewhere, hopefully, there's a happy medium. Everybody, in order to make this work, everybody has to give a little. Okay, you can't. You're not going to solve this problem with everybody getting their way. Everybody has to be a little unhappy when it's all over. And. You know, when the national debate is over with, I think you'll see that. I am proud of the work that our organization did with the Mills administration, with a Democrat majority in the House and Senate. We worked with both parties to pass legislation when other states couldn't. I'm proud of that. Um, I saw that model being effective, and I knew that someday uh, little old Maine would be in front of Congress with some of the things we've done. And that's exactly what has happened. And David, I'm. The si I'm getting a I'm getting signal from the producer here, this signal, which means uh, we, we, we got to wrap it up. Listen, I really appreciate you giving us this interview and this information. It's been helpful to me. I've learned some things in asking these questions of you, and uh, I know a little bit more than I did before, which is a good thing, because I didn't know much. Thank you very much. I, re I, I, re I really appreciate your coming on the program. Graham. All right. Thank you.